What's going on people, welcome back to my channel. It's day two, or I think when this video comes out, it'll be day three of lockdown. It's week two without football. Days are just taking ages to go by. My haircut's starting to grow out a little bit. I need to go get my trim redone, but I can't because I can't go out of my house. Obviously, I'm not gonna complain too much. It could really be a lot worse than it is right now. Things are a bit boring, so we're gonna do another video. In this video today, we are going to be rating every single Chelsea player for their performances throughout the entire season. We're gonna go by player by player. We're gonna analyze their performance. Is we're going to give them all a rating. Obviously, football is a sport of opinions. You lot ain't going to agree with everything I say. You guys are going to disagree with some of what I say. If you guys do, just leave a comment down in the section below. Also, don't forget to like and subscribe. Any likes, any subscribe will really help this channel. So please don't forget to like and subscribe. And let's get straight into the video. As for Laqueta, average. Now, as he's one of those players that you just know what you're going to get with him. You know what he can give you on a football pitch. You know what he can't give you on a football pitch. The guy's great defensively, but he is poor going forward. And this season, it's just more or less the same. And I think... Going forward, you just know you know as Fulquete isn't going to give you much, and that's not even a disrespect to him. He's just a much more defensive-minded fullback, and there's a lot more that's being asked of your fullbacks nowadays compared to a good couple years ago. In a defensive-minded team like Conte's Chelsea or Mourinho's Chelsea, he thrived, but under Lampard and Sarri, he did seem to struggle a little bit. Now he's been moved to the left side a lot more this season to accommodate for Reese James because Reese James is probably our best fullback, maybe even our best crosser in the team. But he's played to his full capacity and he's played exactly to the level that you expect him to do. Going forward, not the best, but you don't expect him to be the best going forward. Defensively, I will say he has looked a bit shaky a couple times, but he's looked a lot more solid. And like I said recently, he's played to his full capacity. He's played to the exact level that we expect him to play to. And he's also been a much more stronger captain for us this season. Last season, there were a lot of question marks about why he was our captain. There was all the stuff at the cup final and Kepper incident and why he didn't try and stay something in that situation as well. But I think he's been a much more stronger captain for the team this season. I think he's been a solid player. Nowhere near exceptionable for us, but I think he's been solid. So I'm going to put Azpilicueta in average. Rhys James, great. Rhys James was slowly integrated into the Chelsea team. He didn't really have a lot of game time at the start of the season, but now he's solidified his position as right back and first choice right back for Chelsea. Is the best crosser in the team. He already has two assists to his name as a Chelsea player who hasn't played a good couple months for us. And honestly, he should have more, but his, cro his cross has just been wasted by some of our attacks and our conversion rate has just been poor. And he's been one of a few players who have seen their stats go down from what they should have been because of that. Now, when it comes to Reese James, the only real poor moments I've seen from him is that Bayern Munich game where Alfonso Davis just tore him a new one for 90 minutes. But that was the only real game where I saw inexperience from him. And other than that, he's had a very solid performance. He's had a very solid breakout season for Chelsea as well. So, so Ross Barkley, Reese James is going to go in great. Kepa, now, this will be a controversial one, I get, but I'm going to put him in the average section. Now, Kepa's conceded 39 goals and he's has one of the worst save percentages in Europe and I get that. He hasn't had a great season by his standards, especially comparing to how good he was last season. But I still don't think he's fully to blame. I think the defence is also to blame as well. We've had a lot of changes in defence, we've had a lot of rotation, a lot of injuries, and we've also had a lot of inconsistencies. Uh, we've also had a lot of inconsistencies in defence. And I think the only player that's can really hold their head up high in defence and say that, that they have had a good season is Reese James. Bar that, I think everyone else has had inconsistencies, hasn't played to their full standards at all. And I think Kepa has suffered as a result of that. But it is still his fault he's conceded 39 goals. I'm not saying it's completely the defence's fault. His handling hasn't been great. He lacks presence in the box. His distribution has even dropped this season as well. Kepa's standards have dropped this season. The only reason why I'm not putting him in poor is because I think there's a lot. There, there are players who have played a lot worse than Kepa, even in the game time that they've had, that are in the poor section. I wouldn't put Kepa in there. Also, because his performances have improved a little bit as well, and I think that with Frank Lampard taking him off and putting him in the bench for a couple games, he has started to improve a little bit as well. Obviously, we can't see how much he has improved because we've only seen two games before the Premier League season has been suspended. But I still don't think Kepa has had a poor season. I think he's had an average season. So I'm going to put him in average. Don't roast me for it in the comments section. Like I said, football is a sport of opinions. You can agree or disagree with what you want. But I'm going to put Kepa in average because I think conceding goals is not just his, jo his job to stop. But it's also the defence's job. And I think they both share the blame here today. So I'm going to put Kepa in average. Willie Caballero, average. Now, Caballero has 
only really seen a lot of game time recently with Kepa being dropped to the bench. And he's been decent. He hasn't been terrible. I'm not saying he's been poor or anything, but I also don't think he's done anything to show that he should be starting over Kepa. And if anything, I think Caballero starting has only proven that it's not really just Kepa's fault for the poor performances and conceding the amount of goals he's conceded. Because goals have still flown in with Willy Caballero in goal. There's still the 2-2 draw against Leicester. Unlucky against Tottenham to concede in the last couple of minutes, I get that. But Bournemouth as well, we also conceded two very early on into the second half there. And I think regardless, the defence is still a problem when it comes to conceding these goals. I think Willy Caballero coming in and still not being able to consistently, to consistently keep clean sheets has only just proven that. I'm not going to say he's been any worse than Kepa. I'm not going to say he's been any better than Kepa. So I'm going to put him in average as well because I don't think either's shown much. I think both have just shown that there is a defensive problem in this team. And that's why we concede so many goals. So I'm going to put Willie in average. Ross Barkley, poor. Ross Barkley has had an amazing last couple games and in the matches against Liverpool and Everton, he showed exactly the sort of player that we thought we were signing for 15 million. But I'm not going to let that cloud my judgement. That's still only been two games. Ross Barkley did start regularly for us over the start of the season, but he was quickly dropped to the bench after a string of forgettable performances. I think there's only two goals for us this season that come against Liverpool in the Cup and Grimsby in the League Cup. And when it comes to Ross Barkley, he seems to be one of those players who just tries to do too much on the ball. Like, that's, I say it a couple times, he tries to move like he's Eden Hazard, but he hasn't got the quality in him to play like that. And that's why he loses the ball too much. And I think Ross Barkley's a sore player who'd be great in a team lower down the league. A team where they'd rely on him just a little bit more. I feel like he tries to be that player for us, but he just hasn't got the quality in him to be that player. And he's only really looked like the player that we initially signed over the last couple of games, so I'm really not going to let that cloud my judgement. Zero league goals and three assists, in my opinion, speak for themselves. I think Barkley's had another poor season, so I'm going to put him in poor. Jorginho, great. Now, I was really close to putting him at excellent, but I want to save that for my personal player of the season. But Jorginho is up there. He has been one of our player of the seasons for this season. He's been brilliant. He silenced a lot of critics. And that pivot between Jorginho and Kovacic has been brilliant to the point where people are questioning where Ka whether Kante should even have game time for us in between the pair of them. Now he's been an important part of the Chelsea side under Lampard, nearly as important as he was under Sarri, but I won't say that as much because the entire team flowed under Mauricio Sarri. Hell, I probably will say that because regardless, same way, the entire team still flows around Jorginho. His leadership and his range of passing has been unmatched in this Chelsea side and we look a lot weaker and we look a lot slower in moving the ball around whenever he's not on the pitch. I'm going to use Arsenal away as a big example. Look at the first 30 minutes before Jorginho stepped onto the pitch and look at the first 30 minutes after. And also look at the fact that Lampard could see the problem so much that he made an early substitution in the 30th minute, took off Emerson and brought Jorginho on. His direct passing is so much has been so decisive for us this season. I think he's even our second highest goal scorer in the Premier League. I get that they're all penalties, but I'm gonna still throw the stat anyway. Jorginho, I'm gonna put in great because he's had a great season for us. So I'm gonna just leave it at that. Jorginho, great. Giroud, good. Giroud's only going to be in good because he hasn't been in the team for ages and I honestly don't know why and the last couple games have only just proved that we really needed to see Giroud on the pitch for a lot more this season. Now I get he had a poor performance against West Ham at home towards the end of last year that might have been why we didn't see game time from him for a little bit longer but honestly the best thing that's happened in January is that we didn't get rid of Olivier Giroud because that's all we really spent January trying to do. And recent performances against United, Liverpool, Spurs and Everton have showed exactly why Olivier Giroud is vital to this team. If you play to his strengths, you've got a great player and you've got a player that can bring the best out of the wingers around him. He isn't the best finisher, I get that. He does miss the odd chance or two, like Bournemouth away showed. He missed a good couple of chances, I can't even lie. But what he offers in link-up play and he, what he offers in hold-up play is unmatched compared to any of our strikers. And he just brings a lot more players in our team into the game and he just brings the best out of them. So Olivier Giroud, I'm going to put in good. Should be great if he had more game time, but I'm going to leave him in good for now. Kante, good. Now, for a player of his quality, he really should be higher, but it's been a frustrating season for him by his standards and just a frustrating for season for him in general. He's battled against injuries throughout the season and when he's played, there's been question marks over whether he should be playing as well because of how solid that Jorginho and Kante pivot looks. Now, he hasn't looked like he's at his best. I personally think he's been rushed into the side a little bit too much. And maybe not even for this season, but for seasons past, I think Kante's always been rushed back in through injury. And I think the suspension might even be best for him because it will give him more time to rest. We might see a new Kante when we come back. 
I don't think he's dropped off. I don't think he's dusted like some people are saying. I think he's just having a poor season. It happens to the best of us. I mean, look at Eden Hazard's 15-16 season if you want to see a season that just sticks out like a sore thumb. So, for N'Golo Kante, I'm going to put him in and good. I don't think he's had a terrible season for us. I just think it's been a poor season by his standards. Hudson Odoi, average. Now, Hudson Odoi had a pretty good return back from injury. Got three assists in his first three games, but it's been a bit of a struggle for him ever since then. He's lacked impact in a lot of games. And there's a lot of expectation on his shoulders as well because the new contract that he signed last season. There's a lot of fans that are now saying, okay, cool, you sign a new bumper, new contract. You need to start showing the performances that justify it. And honestly, he hasn't shown those performances yet, but he is still coming back from an Achilles injury, which is understandable. And me personally, I was willing to throw this season away anyway. This season's all about transition. It's all about development. And Hudson Odoi is already coming back from a setback with this Achilles injury. We weren't really going to see the best out of him anyway. He's still shown signs of potential regardless. He got his first Premier League goal against Burnley in January. And personally, when it comes to one-on-ones against defenders, he's probably the best winger that we have. It's either him or Pulisic in my opinion. But regardless, either one of them are the only ones I'd want to see in a one-on-one -on -one against a defender. But he just needs to be a bit more clinical and he needs to start being a bit more decisive. Games like Leicester, for example, he had a good couple of chances and he, I think he missed hit one and the other one I think he skied. It was understandable that he struggled this year, that's why I'm only putting him in average. But we're still yet to see the best of Hudson Odoi yet and I'd really like to see that next season. So Hudson Odoi, we're going to put him in average. Rudiger, good. Now Rudiger's been out of the team for most of the year with an injury, came back in December against Lille. And he's been a regular in the starting 11 ever since then, whether it's been in the back three with Tamori and Zuma, or recently in 2020 with him partnering Christensen in most of the matches. Now, there's been issues over the back four defensively, and honestly, Rudiger is an exception to this. I think he's been a bit rash as well in some games. But I think he's still brought much-needed experience to this Chelsea side that we need, and we were calling for Rudiger to hopefully come back from injury for months. And even though there's still been mistakes, he still looks a bit more solid and he still looks a bit more wiser than most of our defenders. So I'm going to put Rudiger in good. Mateo Kovacic, excellent. Now, this guy's just our player of the season. I'm going to just put it out there. And I don't think there's a lot of people that are going to disagree with me on this one. Standout performer in the side by a mile. He looks 10 times more comfortable than he did last season under Sarri. And he's developed his game significantly under Frank Lampard. He's starting to add goals to his game. He got his first two goals in the Chelsea shirt last year for us. He's strong on the ball, aggressive. And his dribbling and close control of the ball is up there with the best in the league. He's at his best in a two-man midfield, and I've spoken enough times about that Jorginho and Kante, Jorginho and Kovacic pivot, I'm sorry. But yeah, he's our player of the season by a mile. His performances have been amazing for us, and I'm going to put Kovacic in excellent. He's going to be there by himself, because I think he's the only player that can justify a player of the season award. So I'm going to put Kovacic in excellent. Pulisic, good. But Christian Pulisic barely started for us at the start of the season and there was a lot of questions about his strength on and off the ball and he did look a bit weak at the start of the season, I can't lie. But his game developed a lot under Frank Lampard over the first couple months and as soon as he started getting more game time in the squad, he started firing on all cylinders. He got five Premier League goals in three games, including a hat-trick, a perfect hat-trick in fact against Burnley. Now he looks very threatening on the left side and he's one of our less predictable wingers. A lot more direct and seems to ask a lot more of opposition defenders compared to our other wingers. And it's a shame that he got injured in the new year because he was starting to get into his own at Chelsea and he was starting to clamp down that left hand side as his own. And personally I think he would have been a lot higher in this tiered list if he, was, if he had played a bit more. But he barely played at the start of the season and now injuries have basically kept him out for most of 2020. So I can't put him up that high. So Pulisic is going to have to go in good. I really would put him higher because I think he's shown a lot in the little time that he's played. And I think next season is going to be a much bigger breakout season for him. But as for right now, only in good. Mishi Batshuayi, poor. Now, honestly, I ain't really rated Batshuayi. I haven't rated him since that goal to win us the league in 16-17. And he's been on the bench mostly this season with Tammy Abraham preferred to him. Uh, I'll say with Mishi, he's great at scoring with his first touch or an instinctual strike where he doesn't think about it and he just hits it. But bar that, as soon as he starts taking more touches, it's just a bit dreadful, to be honest. He's useless outside the box. He was given a great chance to make a name for himself against Manchester United with Tammy Abraham out injured and he missed three clear-cut chances in 45 minutes. Honestly, the guy doesn't seem like Chelsea quality to me and he slipped further down the pecking order now. Olivier Giroud started to come into form and receive more game time. 
Personally, I don't think he's been Chelsea quality. I haven't thought he was Chelsea quality for a while. Like I said, he's only really good at scoring with his first touch or strikes inside the box or an instinctual finish. But other than that, he doesn't really offer you much. Olivier Giroud offers you more outside the box. I think Tammy Abraham offers you a lot more strength and a lot more physicality, which is something that Mishi Batshuayi misses as well. His pressing is weak. His pressing is horribly weak. Mishi Batshuayi, I'm going to put him at poor. Personally, I think we should ship him off in the summer. I don't think he's had a great season for us. Mishi Batshuayi, poor. Right guys, this went on for a lot longer than I expected, so I'm actually going to do this in parts. This is the end of part one of the tier list ranking for the Chelsea players for the 2019-2020 season. Let me know if you guys agree or disagree with any of the reigns I've put any of the players in. I know you guys are going to disagree with a couple of them, so guys, let's talk about it down in the comment section because, let's be honest, I'm not really going anywhere. Guys, take care. I'm going to put the part two out either tomorrow or Saturday. Uh, just depends on whatever time I can get out. But guys, don't forget to like and subscribe to this channel. Don't forget to check out this channel for more content if you want to be the first to see it. Don't forget to like and subscribe to Carefree Lewis G. And don't forget to press that little bell bar down in the comment section below for notifications as well. Don't forget to like and subscribe. Don't forget to like and subscribe to Blues Fans TV as well. And we'll see you guys very, very soon. Up the shells.